Welcome back to the Closure Cones walkthrough. This is the episode you've been waiting for. We're going to take a look at macros. So what are macros? Well, macros are a key feature of any Lisp-based language, including Clojure. And they almost single-handedly give the language more power than is possible with practically any other language. So this is why you study Lisp. This is why you study Clojure, is because the power that macros can provide. You're not going to be able to find it anywhere else. So today we're going to see what it's all about. Well, let's take a look. Macros are like functions created at compile time. So you see this def macro at the top. It's defining a hello macro. So far, it looks pretty much like a function. It's taking one parameter, x, and the result is this string expression saying a string of hello, comma, and then the x. So that looks pretty much just like a function, and it sort of behaves like one as well. If we call it here, call hello with this string, it should return back the result hello comma macros the string that was passed and that passes okay so it's like a function but it's created at compile time okay maybe we'll see some more example of that here um, here's a cooler macro so we'll call this infix you know if you've been looking at closure code you're used to this prefix notation where the the function name is the very first element and then the rest of the arguments follow but like if you if you're used to math you you use a lot of infix operators like plus 9 plus 1 you know this this is not valid closure code uh, if this was going to be closure the plus would need to go at the very beginning so here we've got this simple macro called infix where you give it some kind of a form and it's going to return back wow it's kind of complicated we're returning a list with three elements and the first element is the second piece of the form followed by we're going to use the first element of the form and then the third element of the form so it's expecting form to have three items in it and it's just going to put them in this new order return a list with them in a new order so what happens when we call infix macro with this form and notice notice something here we're we're not quoting this this is this is not quoted and yet it's not giving us any error well that's the secret of macros <laughs> when you pass parameters to a macro they are not evaluated first the raw code the raw structure is passed to the macro and the macro can do whatever it needs to do with that raw structure so as you see here it's taking this form this structure of three elements and returning a list with those three elements in a new order so let's see what would get returned we know that a list is getting returned and the first item in the list is the second element of the form so it would be the plus the next element is the first element of the form the nine and the last element is index 2, <laughs> which is the third element of the original form. So that would be the 1. Mm. Well, that didn't work. So the macro said it's returning a list, right? Why didn't a list get returned? Well, what's actually going to happen, the expression that it returns is going to get executed this 9 plus 1 is executed and it'll return an actual 10 value okay so that's kind of tricky this is uh, something we've never seen before 
but let's keep moving. Okay, remember these are nothing but code transformations. So something to help us out here is this macro expand function. So macro expand takes a call to a macro and it's going to expand that out and show you the result. So here's where we would expect the result to come back, the list of the uh, plus and the nine and the one. And yeah, that passes. So macro expand can really help us out to see what does this macro return for given uh, different values that we pass to it. So we can kind of see exactly what the macro is doing. So that was kind of neat. Um, I mean, here we're dealing with a prefix based language and yet there's a way through just defining a simple macro it seems like where we can get the functionality of infix. So let's look at this. Uh, they're calling this infix better. So what's better about this one? Well, it looks like they're demonstrating a new syntax for defining these macros and it's using this back quote or the syntax quote and this tilde character or they're calling that the unquote. So using these characters can be a more concise way to write your macros because macro is generally returning it's kind of like a template. You're, you're writing a template for what code you want to, to be generated out of this. Um, so why don't we look at a quick example. Before we saw uh, the single quote character and we might know how that works. We can have a list and that's just treating this list as data. Now what though, what about if we had something in here like well, I wanted this list to say one, two, and then three, but I put in an expression here that should evaluate to three, but the problem is that this is telling closure to treat this entire expression as data, and it's not going to try to evaluate anything in here. Okay, so let's say, let's say that we are trying to get the string one, two, three, or sorry, the list one, two, three. Now we can express that using this back quote or syntax quote. And actually let's verify that these are equivalent. Yes. Okay. So, so far these are equivalent. Now, what if I didn't have the three readily available, but I instead wanted to evaluate this expression that would evaluate to three and that's, this is not working. These are not equivalent because again, this back quote or syntax quote is causing the whole thing to be treated as data and it's not going to try to evaluate this expression inside. So what we can use is this unquote character, the, the tilde, and we can tell it to go ahead and evaluate this expression. So there you go. We do that and suddenly this part of the, of the structure is going to get evaluated and inserted. So we do end up getting one, two, three. So that's a quick demonstration of the syntax quote and the unquote character and how they kind of work. You can see how it'd be very useful for templating. So let's delete this and deal with our example. So infix better. Um, it looks like we're just trying to do the exact same thing as we did with the infix macro, but we're going to use the syntax quote and the unquote. So the second item in this list is first form. And we have to remember to use the unquote to make that expression get evaluated. And finally, we're going to evaluate this expression nth form two. So what happens when we expand this macro infix better and we're passing 10 times 2. Yeah, it should behave the same as it did above. So we should get back this list times 10 and 2. True. 
Uh oh, things don't always work as you would like them to. So here we're calling macro expand and we're calling the infix better macro. But look at this. We're calling 10 plus, uh oh, not a number, but another infix expression. It's two times three. So I don't think our macro is built to handle this. So what do we get back actually? Uh, if we treat it literally, uh, just kind of go through this. The first element is going to be the plus. That gets moved to the front. And then we're going to use the 10. And finally, the, the, the last expression is just going to be passed in straight up as 2 times 3. It's not modified in any way. So that's what we get. So if this macro expands to this expression and then this expression were to be evaluated, it's going to fail because closure does not know what to do with this. It's going to try to treat the two as a function and that's not going to fly. So look what we have here. A recursive infix definition for this macro. Uh, and this is a good line. Really, you don't understand recursion until you understand recursion. So I think here in this example, we're going to fully <laughs> understand recursion. So here they're able to call this recursive infix macro and they're passing a pretty complicated structure here. 10 plus another expression, infix expression, two times three, and then another plus and, and another infix expression and that's evaluating to 36 so that's a pretty impressive macro let's take a look and see how it works we have to fill in a couple of blanks here but most of the work is already done for us so let's just take a look so recursive infix takes a form as a parameter and the first thing it does is check different conditions if this form is not a sequence, then what do we do? Then if it's just a like a raw number, like a 10, in that kind of a case, I think we just return back that uh, the form itself. There's no more work to do on it. Uh, however, if the form has one element in it, it's a sequence with one element, look what we're doing here, we're calling uh, recursive infix with the evaluation of the first element of the form. So we're making a recursive call breaking out of uh, that, that single element out of that form. Now if it's neither of those two conditions we're, we're just going to do this. We're going to initialize three variables so we're going to say the operator is the second element of the form and we're used to seeing that, right? Like the second element of this form is the plus, so we'll call that the operator. Uh, the first arg we're going to say is the first element of the form, so that would be like the 10. And the others is what? The others is what? I guess the others must just be the whole rest of the list, right? So it's kind of what I guess we could call this the rest of the rest of the form. Maybe we could just say that. Actually, that looked like it made a pass. So let's continue on and see what, what is actually being returned now. So once we've initialized these three variables, we're translating that into a list where the first item is the operator and the second item is the result of calling ourselves recursively, recurse the recursive infix macro again passing the first arg uh, and then recursive infix on the whole rest of the expression. So why do we need to call recursive infix again on this kind of argument? Well in this case here like you saw a 10 was being passed that's just a a plain old number. Well, it's safe. I mean, we know it's safe to call recurs recursive infix with a simple value like that because it'll get matched all the way at the top. It's not a sequence, so the number itself will just be returned. However, we're not limited to just simple numbers like that. We could, in fact, be passing a whole other expression like 
a two times a three. Uh, that could be right here as the first first argument. So that kind of explains why we need to call recursive infix even on the first argument. And then what's happening here when we call recursive infix on the others? Well, in that case, this whole rest of the expression here is treated as another expression that we need to call recursive infix on. And we can see how that works out really nicely because the first element here will be the first arg and then the operator and then the rest and everything just kind of repeats from there and it recursively handles each of these structures as it encounters them. So, man, that was kind of neat. That's kind of um, a big macro that we've seen, but it was pretty powerful when you see the result. It gave us the power of infix notation in just one simple macro. Well, this was just a taste, the tip of the iceberg of how macros work and what kind of power they can give you. There is a whole lot more we can cover, um, but this, I hope, got you interested. All right, well, thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next video.